Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. If you use hand planes, sooner or later, you're going to have to reestablish your primary bevel. I'm going to show you how to grind a plane blade. The easiest way is on a power grinder. Stay with me. I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the notification bell so you'll receive alerts when we release a new video. And anytime we use a special tool, we'll always leave a description down below. All right, let's get to work. If you use a traditional bench plane, the blade is positioned with the bevel on the bottom side. So this thing called the frog presents that blade at 45 degrees. So the primary bevel can, or none of the bevels, can exceed 45 degrees. If so, the heel will touch instead of the toe and it won't work. Now, if you lower it too much, make that primary bevel too acute, then you have such a small amount of material out there at the edge that it simply won't hold an edge. So 25 degrees has been decided upon as the best primary bevel from which to start. Now, the way I do it, I freehand sharpen, and to save both time and materials, since the only part that really matters is the point where the back of the blade and the bevel actually meet, I start off with my core stone. I set that blade on the 25 degree bevel, lift it up just a few degrees, and create what we call a secondary bevel. And then I go to my finishing stone, I set it on the primary bevel, and then I raise it up a few degrees higher than I did over here, and I create something called a tertiary bevel. Now I tell you this because in the process of freehand sharpening, each time you go back and resharpen, you're going to extend your secondary bevel and you'll eventually get to a point where the secondary bevel has gotten too long and it's taking you a lot of extra time to sharpen. So this is probably the primary example as to when you're going to go in and reestablish that main bevel. Another reason is you've damaged the corner and you've knocked that corner off, now you've got to get all the way down below that before you can get a true straight edge. And that's a lot of work to do by, with, by hand. That's where you're going to want to grind. Another example, actually let's do this one first. Just a really bad primary bevel. If you're trying to learn freehand sharpening, you really need to have that starting point, which is your primary bevel. And if your primary bevel looks like that, there's no way that you can feel any of those on the stone. So that needs to have a nice new primary bevel established. And the fourth reason is that in freehand sharpening, and this frequently happens, you simply got the blade out of square. Well, your plane is equipped with what's called a lateral adjustment lever. So when the blade is in place and that bearing sits in that, in that long slot, it allows you a certain amount of adjustment in order to get the blade so that it projects from the sole parallel to the sole. That simply means that you're taking a shaving that is the same thickness on both sides and when you're planing the edge of a board, you're removing the same amount of material and not throwing it out of square. If you exceed the limit that the lateral adjustment will allow, then you can no longer get a uniform projection. So, if you check, if you're having problems getting the blade even across the width of the sole, and you check it with a square, and you see that you're no longer square, you've got to go back and reestablish that on your bench grinder. All of these jobs, or all of these circumstances, present a job that just takes too much time if you're trying to do it freehand. A bench grinder is the best way to do it, and it's the quickest way. And while a lot of people fear burning the steel, I'm going to show you how you can do it without any worries. A grinder does not have to be the most expensive piece of equipment in your shop. In fact, you can usually get away with a grinder somewhere around $100. Um, there's two options, 6-inch wheels and 8-inch wheels. I think you're going to have a greater variety if you go with the 8-inch uh, wheel over the 6. They seem to be more popular. And the only time that I can think of a real advantage, if you're grinding a mortise chisel, because of how thick it is this way, when you set the chisel on the wheel, you take part of that radius, and it's called hollow ground. And when, you, when your blade is really thick this way on a six inch wheel to establish, let's say a 30 degree bevel where you're measuring with a straight edge touching the tip of the blade and back here, there's such a hollow in there that you really make this a very weak edge. So for that reason, 
uh, from a technical standpoint, the eight inch is gonna be superior. So there's not a lot of difference in price. I'd say go with this eight inch over the six. Final two considerations in buying a bench grinder. Do I buy new or used? And what speed of a grinder do I want? New or used, of all the tools you're gonna have in a woodworking shop, your bench grinder is probably going to be the least expensive power tool. You can usually pick one up for somewhere around $100. For that reason, I'd say buy new, at least you're getting a guarantee. Always the problem with buying used is you have no idea how it's been misused and how long is it gonna last you. The final option is what speed. Now bench grinders typically come at 1,725 RPM, that stands for revolutions per minute, or 3,450. You can actually get ones that are variable speed, but I'll address that at the end. If I was choosing between the two, I don't think it's that big of a deal, but I would probably go for the slower speed. Um, the, how fast that wheel's spinning really doesn't come into play that much in terms of how the tool is going to perform and how fast it's going to grind. It has more to do with the amount of pressure you're applying. So I'd say maybe the slower one is gonna be a little bit safer, particularly if you're using a traditional grinding wheel. Now, the variable speed, I have that option on mine and I don't think I've ever changed it. So my option is, or my suggestion is buy the slower speed, but if it's not, if it's not an option, the 3450 would be just as good. It won't take very long once you start using a grinder to realize how important the actual tool rest is, second only to the wheel. And the problem with most inexpensive grinders, they come with such a cheap tool rest, it's not worth messing with it. I just say get rid of it and get yourself one of these. Small investment that'll make an inexpensive grinder a great tool. This is called a one-way um, grinding jig. It comes with two pieces, the uh, base plate and what's called the platform assembly. Now, it does not fasten to the grinder. It fastens to the table beside the grinder, which means you may have to raise, raise your grinder up by putting a block of wood underneath it, or you may have to raise up the base plate by putting something underneath that. This is designed to, it'll go on either side, so you can move the lever to the opposite end if you want to put it on the other side of your grinder. Everything operates off of a cam. So once this is in place, you put your platform assembly in there, get it where you want it, and a quick push on the lever locks it in place. Now, this plate is a nice thick, quarter inch thick piece of steel, gives you lots of room, but it also acts as a great heat sink to help keep the blade cool while you're grinding. You just get it into whatever angle you want and then lock it. You can pull the lever out and move it around like that so that you can get it in the right position. Fantastic piece of kit, and like I said, that alone will turn an inexpensive grinder into a precise tool. For the average home shop, there's really two options when it comes to wheels. This one's a little bit newer, I'll talk about this one first. What I would call a traditional wheel. Somewhat porous, in fact it's very porous. Uh, my recommendation if you're going to go with this, you want to get the coarsest wheel you can find. 36 grit is what I have on here, and the reason is the coarser it is, the faster it'll cut and the cooler it'll cut. The downside to these wheels, when you put them on, they're rarely balanced. Too many times you've got to put it on, stop, reposition it, tighten it up again, try to get it in a spot where it'll actually will run somewhat true. These wear, and because of that you have to constantly be dressing them and making sure that they're nice and flat across the end, and that's a little bit of a violent process. I'll demonstrate it. So I would consider this to be a poor option for a grinding wheel, regardless of the brand. This is relatively new, this is called a CBN wheel, it stands for carbon boron nitrate. And the nice thing about these is they're very heavy. If you were to compare the two, this weighs at least twice, maybe three times the amount. Because it's made out of steel, it's automatically balanced, so you put it on, it runs true. It never goes out of flat, so you never have to dress the wheel. It will eventually wear, but you're gonna get a lot of use out of it between now and then. And this abrasive that is used, I believe it's held on with a nickel coating, is very hard and it will cut steel easily. The speed difference between grinding a primary bevel on this versus this, this is probably three times faster. Not only that, but it cuts very, very cool. So while you're constantly having to dip the plane blade to keep it cool using this one, 
I suggest you can probably grind your primary bevel without ever having to dip it if you're using this wheel. Now the downside is this is cheap, this is expensive. But if results and time mean anything, I think this is the wheel that you should look at. We'll leave a link below on where you can get these. And this is an 80 grit wheel, which is plenty coarse for this style of cutting. Now, it's going to appear as if I'm trying to convince you to go with the CBN wheel, and you're right, I am. When you see how much um, adjusting and messing around you have to do in order to get this wheel to run true, and we used to use these all the time, so I'm speaking from experience when I tell you about this. We just put that wheel on, so the first thing I'm going to do... What? I'm going to walk you through the process of grinding a primary bevel. We're going to use both stones. We're going to do it the first with the traditional wheel, and the second time we do it with another blade, we'll use the CBN wheel. And if you think I'm trying to convince you of the CBN wheel, you're right. I've used these enough throughout my career to tell you this is a pain, and you're going to see why. First thing we have to do is we've got to get this to run true. So I'm going to adjust my rest close to the wheel, make sure that clears. Now we want this to be, we want this to run true so that when we're putting a tool against it, it's not skipping. We also want that to be fairly open and aggressive. These have a tendency to get clogged up and that's why there's various tools to deal with them. I'll show you the first one, but it's, it's so slow and it's not cheap. This is an attachment made by one way that goes into the same apparatus that your tool rest does. It's got a diamond point on there and you've got to be careful you have to constantly be rotating it because you'll wear it and what you would do is while this is spinning and you've got some very very minor adjustment back here but what you're going to do is while that wheel is spinning let's back this off now that just sits in there and it's up to you to keep this tight you don't want it to touch just yet, but while it's, while the wheel is running, actually we'll go ahead and do it. So while I'm turning this, there's quite a bit of difference between the movement here and the movement you're going to get here. But you'll eventually make contact. There it is. So I would run slowly side to side until I'm making contact the whole way. But remember, you've got a very small point on there, so you can't move it too fast. Now this is the most accurate way of truing that face, but the problem is that I find that it makes it so smooth, it doesn't cut very well. So that leaves me having to come in and use that other tool to open up that face to make it more aggressive. My purpose in using this is to get that wheel balanced so it's truly round. I don't remember what I paid for this, but I know it wasn't cheap. So once I'm there, take this off. my platform assembly back in and I could use it as it is right now but as I said the face is so smooth it's not very aggressive and it doesn't cut very fast you can also true it with this device which is far less expensive and you would come in and just use those that's a CBN product as well and you would just go side to side truing up that face probably best to wear a dust mask when you're doing this now here's the one that I call violent. So you've got these little wheels in a cast iron handle. You can replace these as they get used. But you're going to go in there. Moving side to side to try to keep the face of the wheel flat. Now that'll make it far more aggressive when it comes to grinding. Now you can shut the grinder down if you want to do this or you can simply do it while it's running and just be careful you want to match the tool rest
to the wheel so that you're producing a 25 degree primary bevel. Now the easiest way to do it, let me get one of these ones that is Here's the one that has the bad corner. This is brand new. That's flat ground. So I want to adjust the tool rest so that I'm just touching right in the middle of that bevel. I'm way up here at the tip, so I've got to raise this up. I want to keep the tool rest close to the wheel as well. That has to come higher. Okay, I'm touching right here. I want to come down just a little bit lower. I should say I want to raise this up a little bit higher. I want to bring the contact point down a little lower. Okay, so we're touching just about in the middle of that bevel. So that's going to maintain my 25 degree primary. It's going to be hollow ground, meaning I'm going to take the radius of that stone and put it onto here so there'll be a slight hollow, but nothing to worry about. Now you want to keep, make sure everything is tight. You want to keep the blade tight to the face of the tool rest. And with very light contact pressure, and I like to move it side to side, just in case that face is not perfectly parallel to this. Now you can see where I've made contact. I'm a little heavier on this side than I am on that side. I prefer to start over here. Edge of the blade is beyond the edge of the stone. And then as I come in, I'm moving over here because I want to engage the blade somewhere in the middle of the stone. If you're out here and you try to do it, you're gonna end up banging into that side and you'll end up taking a corner off. So come in here somewhere. I'm moving forward always keeping the blade tight to the rest. I'm moving forward at the same time I'm moving laterally. Make my contact and when I get out here rather than go right to the end I'm going to disengage before this part of the blade gets to this side of the wheel and then I'll go back the other way. If you don't disengage, if you go like this, you end up grinding in that one area twice as much as anywhere else. A it's going to overheat and B you're going to end up grinding off more and throwing it out of whack with the rest of the bevel. So engage, disengage. Now I don't pull it back very far, that way I'm not way down here trying to find that contact point. I just disengage enough that I'm not making contact twice as long in one spot. Now. I keep flipping this over and having a look. I want one nice facet. I want to keep this square, as square as possible, and this is where you're going to need to have a square in your pocket. Now if you're really out of square out in the end, you're going to have it out here checking. But you'll notice that I've got quite a bad neck. I've got two options. I can continue to do this, but you've got to remember at some point I've got nothing very little steel out here which means it's going to be very susceptible to burning. My suggestion when you're dealing with something bad like that is to actually come in, we're going to have to redo this, have that sitting so it's almost tangent to the wheel and then come in and literally grind the end of the blade, light touch, until you get down below the bottom of that neck. Now that means you're blunting off the end of the blade but at least you're not dealing with that little feather of steel by doing it on an angle. You gotta be careful to make sure that you're keeping it square. I'm favoring this side a little bit, so I'll work a little more on the left. Okay, I've managed to get down below that damaged area. I'll check this to see and it looks pretty close. So now I've got to go back in, re-establish my tool rest so that I'm back at my 25 degree primary bevel and then I can just continue to grind 
until I bring this back to a point. And it doesn't look it, but there's quite a bit of work involved in order to get rid of that. Because in order to get rid of that thickness you see right there, all of this surface area has to come off a substantial amount. Now you may want to have a container of water close by simply because this wheel, as I mentioned, has a tendency to cut hot. The reason is this stone doesn't heat up at all. Everything goes into the blade, the tool rest, and the sparks that are going off. You're going to see a big difference when we talk about the CBN wheel because it actually takes a lot of the heat just because of its construction. So give me a second to reposition this grinder and we'll go back and show you how we would finish that. And once you've already started grinding that bevel, if for any reason you have to change things, it's difficult to come back in and find where the stone is actually touching. So what you can do is come in with a Sharpie or any kind of a marking pen and just color that. You can also get down here and eyeball that as well. Okay, and high. Went a little bit too far. keep my fingers close to the edge of the blade that way if it gets too hot I'll know you don't want to overheat the blade and burn it you take the temper out of the steel and it'll no longer hold an edge and the only way to get rid of it if you've done that is you've literally got to grind down through it best way is as I mentioned make your tool rest tangent to the wheel go in grind down below and then start again keep checking Every few seconds, turn it over and just have a look and see how you're doing. Remember to keep that tight to the face of the tool rest. If the blade gets too hot that you can't touch it, just dip it in some water for a second. It'll cool down and you can go back to work. All right, now we'll use the CBN wheel. This is the blade that is at a square by quite a bit. So we know we've got to take a lot of material off of here. And again, if you're new at doing this, every little bit helps. Go in there and paint that bevel. So we want to favor this side. We've got to get our grinding rest where we want it. looks pretty good. So since this is the side that needs it, what I'm going to do is start here about in the middle of the, the edge of the blade is in the middle of the wheel and I'll just enter while I'm moving laterally. I'm not coming over here because this is the low corner. I've got to bring the high corner down to the low corner. So there's no reason to touch it over here. a little too much off of there so we'll focus back here I love how aggressively this CBN wheel cuts still haven't got well, we actually did a little bit but not too bad That's still high on that right side. Remember, lots of pressure in against the tool rest 
to keep it from rising up and giving you multiple facets. Frequently check. Still high. You need to be patient. Even with the CBN wheel, you can burn the steel. And this is actually another example where we could have gone in, laid the tool rest tangent to the wheel, and literally blunted the end to get it perfectly squared up. The danger with not doing it that way is you're always working with a little feather of steel out at the, at the end, and it's easy to burn. A little bit low on that far corner, but a lot closer. By the way, after all that grinding, that, that is barely warm. Have a look and see. Okay, I could work with that. So in the typical situation where you've just made your secondary bevel too wide, then this is an easy process of going in, regrind that without going all the way to the edge. If the edge is still square, there's no reason to alter it. What we want to do is just shorten that secondary bevel and we'll leave it when we have just a little shiny bit at the very edge going end to end. Okay, we're almost there, but I would take that and I would cut that little bit of bevel that's still there in half and then call it done. If you find yourself taking more off of one side than the other, then just avoid that. By If I was taking more, too much off on the left, I would start with the edge of the blade, the left side away from the stone, and just go in until I catch up. I'd stop right there. A nice advantage of the hollow ground is how easy it is to locate that primary bevel when you're trying to learn freehand sharpening. This becomes your point of reference and then you come up from there. And by the way, if you use the Charlesworth ruler trick, providing you're never having to restraight or straighten the edge or uh, repair damage, you'll probably never have to go back in and redo that. The little bit of polishing you do after each sharpening is enough to keep that back bevel working just the way it's supposed to. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. Now I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website introduce you to all of our tools that we actually manufacture right here, as well as our workshops, both in person and online. Good luck.